Okay, third time's a charm. Hope you're all doing well out there wherever you are and whatever you're doing. This is a grumpy old guy and we've got some Dragon Quest to boot it up. So, if you're familiar with the series, if you are a um, recurring visitor to the channel, you already know it's time to find a comfy spot because we're going to be talking RPGs both retro digital and tabletop today. And if you're new to the channel, welcome. You can call me Agog, though there's really nothing stopping you from calling me anything else. Not like I'm going to hear it. And we're going to be playing some Dragon Quest 2 while I talk simultaneously, sort of back and forth in a rambling fashion, about this game as we're playing it and my tabletop RPG campaign. Picking up here, we made our way down into the second continent, and we are looking for the Princess of Moonbrook Castle, but more importantly, for us in the short term, we're looking for a couple levels, because we were getting our tail kicked, Orfeo met the Reaper a couple times, doesn't fear him, but we should probably get some more hit points. Tabletop RPG Space. That series was, well, this series, was a little bit stunted this past week. Um, last week's session did not go down. Um, gonna save you the gory details on this, suffice to say. I sort of cursed myself assuming that I wouldn't get sick. And um, spent a couple days down. This week, unfortunately, one of my players was sick. And I was all ready and amped up to go, but life sort of got in the way. Um, even got my little, <laughs> my little ration snacks built. Um, which meant since the session was cancelled, I essentially tried way too hard to pack four lunches. That's what the end game math is. I did make little paper labels for them, and I'm not a skilled artist. So instead of trying to come up with a cohesive plan and make four copies of that. I just made four individual labels and I think they turned out pretty darn well for what they were. We're gonna fireball that magician, get it out of here. Avoiding the poison so far, this is a good sign. We should be gaining enough gold that the end down here isn't going to be a problem. So one of the things I do have an affinity for is uh, puns slash dad jokes. So the first label I made for the rations, and they were just little snack packs. I mean, I, I put together a little baggie of sunflower kernels and honey roasted peanuts, uh, chunked up some cheddar cheese, threw in a couple Slim Jims, um, some store brand Triscuits, and uh, a couple packs of fruit snacks. Nothing crazy. In fact, that was all bought at the dollar store just in a little plastic container. But like I said, I made custom little labels on them. And I was going to set them up like they were on a shelf at a general store. So we got the full effect. And the first one, like I said, was an old school D&D deep cut. Picked up a bamboo stick, that's worth a couple gold. Uh, let's go ahead and have Orfeo cast heal on himself, and then we will limp back to town for an in-stay and sell that stick. Now, if you were playing old school D&D, and I'm talking like basic like I started, and you were buying gear, sort of like at a shop like the one we're at, you had two choices for your rations. You could either buy regular rations that would last for a day or two, 
and they were fairly cheap. Or if you had some gold on you, and you were heading out for a while, like, you really wanted to get the iron rations, because the iron rations were going to stay. That was the preserved stuff. So the first one I came up with was a label, and this was probably the most god-awful art I had. It was a silhouette, and it still didn't translate well. Um, I tried to draw, like, a Whistler's mother inspired, inspired old lady on a rocking chair. And in its own twisted way, it kind of worked out, because it literally looked like an Iron Maiden just sort of uncomfortably propped against a chair. And I labeled it Granny Irons Quality Plasticine Rations. Both a joke on the iron rations and the fact that it was in a plastic container. Um, the next one I made had a little sort of red bearded Viking dude on it because I'm drawing all of this with my trusty four color pen. And I named it Ready, R E D D I E, comma, for adventure. Uh, the Sustenance Variety Pack. The third one I named after one of my uh, Shadow Dark Solo characters. I had rolled up a thief with the wanted background who's going on the assumed name of Lucky Day because he was fleeing the constable and just happened to stop in the inn about the same time the party was looking to recruit a new member. So I sort of retconned it in my head that his side hustle was just sort of infomercial salesman. Orpheus is getting it taken to him this morning, by the way. So we had Lucky Days certified with an asterisk. Uh, quality rations, 100% fresh also with an asterisk, and then as a little footnote on the label in fine print, I had next to an asterisk indicating that any time you saw said asterisk, it meant enough. So it was Lucky Day certified, enough, rations, 100% fresh, enough. Felt that was a fun little vague way of putting it. The third one I wrote was a pure Shadow Dark homage. Um, if you've ever looked at the Shadow Dark stuff, and even if you haven't, it's still there. Uh, they have a little gear package set aside. I'm a huge fan of these things because they sort of give you your apartments right away. Nice critical hit there from Agog. Um, This is going to be a huge test for us getting through this. No poison. But the little equipment kit they have with like your rope, a couple torches, your rations and whatnot that you could buy right out of the book is called a crawler's kit. So I made a little label that said, you know, Crawler's Kit Rations. I think I wrote the original, because everything has to be the original, right? And I put down underneath, may help extend your adventure, won't help stab wounds. Just took my pen and doodled a little sword, shield, fork, and spoon on it. And then the fourth one... trying to remember what the fourth one was. Like, it's just in the fridge there. It's escaping my mind. That's crazy. But yeah, I did that. And now I guess, you know, the house has lunches for the week, is essentially what it boils down to. But that did not deter the gaming in any way, shape, or form. If anything, I was that much more resolute since, you know, I was all prepped and ready to go to have a session of any type, so we played a home game last night. And, um, 
Wifey and Boyo, they made their way through the Red Hand Trail uh, the previous time. They had found a little side passage, a brook trickling out through, uh, through a gap in the rock wall that was big enough to sort of squeeze through. It was comfortable enough to use as a secondary passage, but not a super viable one for means of transportation of anything larger than like a body shimmying in. Sort of sideways, like if you're walking between two buildings that are put together close enough that you can get through, but it feels uncomfortably close as you're approaching it. Again, if you've been in that situation, you know what I'm talking about, and if not, you probably think I'm half crazy. Um, but just one of those deals, and that's going to play into the end game real quick. But they used this side passage because they kept getting stuck every time they walked through the main door. It was just a slog for them. Even with me slowly thinning out encounters based on what they had done the previous time. There was just a lot of stuff packed in there. In hindsight, I could have probably thinned out some of the stuff, but its first adventure, that sort of sense of having to come back and restart really wasn't a negative to me. So they find this side passage and they make their way a little deeper in. They manage to surprise and almost blow said surprise on the first the first encounter. Goblins and Shadow Dark spoilers for those who are looking into playing the system don't want to give too much away but they have an inherent ability where they can't be inherently surprised but I did give it to them on sneaking up that they could go ahead and sneak up as long as they were far enough away that the light source wouldn't tip it off getting a good bit of army ants in this encounter So they did sneak up on the goblins. Well, the goblin. But my wife got a little reckless with her thief character. Gonna take a moment and heal up here. Ultimately, in Dragon Quest 2, we're just kind of working on more hit points and more gold to buy some better gear for Agog. Um, he's still, by and large, working off the stuff we started the game with. But she got carried away and she tried for the old dreaded sneak attack and missed the attack. Instantly the goblin went to flee, alert others, and um, my son had come in and magic missiled it done to death, but right over top of a little log that served as an actual bridge. So the goblin fell into the brook, made a big splashing sound, and alerted the next wave of goblins either way. These three they dispatched in a hurry. And they managed to do that without tipping off more, so they had a chance to sneak up and see what is essentially the crux encounter, the main encounter in this module. Um, I did narrow the numbers down a little bit here, but it's essentially a goblin boss. I think the module had ten goblin minions and I went out it down. I only did nine and it had three wolves and I went out that down to two. But either way you're looking at a 12 on three encounter. I know I've only got two players here and on three seems a little weird but my son actually played two characters. He played both his mage spells and his fighter swords. Um, 
So they see this encounter and they wisely decide not to charge in directly and decide, look, there's only one way they're realistically leaving this cave. So they go back to the main entrance of the cave through their side entrance so they don't, you know, wake up anything that had settled in and started sleeping in the background in their time away. Just sort of carefully backtracked and got ready to ambush the goblins coming out of the mouth of the cave. They had yet to learn the inherent ability of goblins not to be surprised. So they were planning on taking them completely by surprise and whatnot. And I gave them a few turns to set up, sort of think everything through. Spells, as it turns out, knew the goblin tongue because wizards in Shadow Dark get an unseemly amount of languages. So they knew the goblins were planning on taking out the village that night, which made sense to me because it was their third attempt inside the cave. It was time for decisive action one way or another. 1467, I think we're going to pop up to the weapon shop in here and see how much we need for the next available sword. Kind of forgot where I was going there. My apologies. Broadsword is 1500, so we are almost there. If we can get the broadsword and the full plate armor, I think that should put us at a pretty reasonable point equipment wise and then let's just get a couple more hit points and wander over to uh moonbrook let's take out that magic drakey because i believe it can cast sleep and fireball the cobra to get rid of a poison enemy sleep always annoying in these games but the original Magidraki cast Heal in the first Dragon Warrior, and that was sometimes worse if you were not dealing a ton of damage out of the gate. Now the goblins <clears throat> in the campaign get to the mouth of the cave. And they are very aware of the heroes at this point because some some folks keep clotsily stumbling in the main door and fighting with things. So they are well aware that they are being at least surveilled or that something is poking around in their cave. In true old D&D fashion, it's a cave full of goblins with a random encounter with a grizzly bear, by the way, uh, that the party thankfully did not stumble upon as just an optional challenge boss. But they get to the mouth of the cave and the goblin boss just sort of pokes his head out, recognizes a little, little tinge of something in the air that feels somewhat familiar to some of these scenes where they've found dead goblins or centipedes or whatnot while traipsing through their cave and realizes the enemy is outside. So he cautions his troop, says it out loud, the wizard over here knows the cover is blown party moves in from the little thicket of bushes they were hiding in. That's our first poison of the day. That's not so bad. Times like this, Orpheo comes in huge. Just that little extension one more battle, one or two more battles here before we wrap it up uh, for this run. Don't know why I fought there with Orpheo. He clearly doesn't have the firepower on his own. To... Well, maybe he does. 
That'll at least save us some MP. But as you can see, four magicians are going to wreck health at this point. We got a level up. Not sad about that. Only two extra hit points, but we'll take it. Wow, that is a rough spot to get caught. Let's see if we can one round this. Nope. <laughs> Not quite strong enough. Okay, no harm, no foul. Gonna hit the end and do a quick save here. We'll continue on because I'm still rambling and we're only 20 minutes in. Now, in my head, I saw this encounter going about one way because they knew they wanted to alert the town and that was my party's original plan but there just wasn't enough time by the time they had got back they'd essentially just be leading the goblins to town so they kind of drew their line in the sand as it were and made their stand there and as they're closing in i didn't want to swarm them with 12 enemies because even with three it's two level two characters and a level one like they're not gonna make it so instead i just had this picture of like double dragon in my head where you get wave after wave of minion and at the end you have a couple henchmen goons and the boss and essentially, especially in that first stage of Double Dragon, where you face the Robobo guy, um, that's how I know him forever, thanks to Boss Monster. But he doesn't even feel like a threat, he just kind of feels like a dick who's taking cheap shots at you the whole time. Let's fireball the Magician. Because stop spell is nice, but fireball stops the spell and the magician. Okay, I believe the Magidray, he lowered our defense there. That's never fun. We should be moving up on Orpheus' level up here. <laughs> But yeah, the boss is just basically going to sit there and antagonize the party, take some cheap shots. But first you have to deal with these waves. And I didn't really pull any punches tactically. Because I wanted them to feel the pressure of this being a boss encounter. This is one I didn't mind getting a little more intense. So instantly you had the first wave of goblins, they were coming out three at a time, but before those goblins could get out, the wolves darted forward. And they blew right by the front line, as the wolves have a higher move rate in the game. And they went right for the mage who was in the background, because the mage has the torch. They're attacking at sunset a little after sunset and sort of those twilight hours so they need a light source at this point and the wolves go after the squishiest target and the holder of the light source so instantly the party's plan of just you know tanking the front line damage is out the window and they have to think very carefully about their moves here i'm making all of my rolls like right out on the table there it's a flat damage system, so the damage is heavily reduced, but the hit points are also heavily reduced from what you'd think, especially in a more modern iteration of D&D. I don't think there was a character in double-digit hit points. There, one of them may have had ten. So instantly, this was going to be a pretty life-or-death struggle, and they handled the first couple goblins well. I had knocked the grunts down uh, to one hit point apiece, so if they hit them, they killed them. I felt that was a fair compromise, given the numbers. But 
but the numbers game did eventually catch up and there was some pretty serious damage going on. Both spells and swords, I want to say, were down to just a couple hit points throughout, and they have no healing magic in the party. The wolves were a decided challenge for them. Another thing I sort of house rule is that they can go ahead and pick up um, one lock token per character per session. And those lock tokens, I want to say, were blown through in the first couple rounds of combat. I want to say the first lock token was actually cashed in within the cave itself on those first couple goblin attacks. Nice critical hit there from Agog. But it did not take long for them to cash in the others. And pretty soon it's just roll high or maybe die. And like you could feel things were getting tense. They had already blown through one torch on time. They're about halfway through the goblins. And now all of a sudden Raziel, uh, um, my wife's thief, who by virtue of being that in that first play test and getting me at like my most giving in treasure, is already well and truly ahead of the other characters in terms of gear and stats. But eventually, if you swing enough at a target, you're going to hit. And that was what was happening here, and at one point, got low enough that she actually hit zero hit points exactly. I'm not a death at zero hit points guy, especially for my home game, because, you know, I got a nine-year-old kid there. Um, I like giving a chance. Shadow Dark as written gives you con mod plus d4 rounds to stabilize. And in this situation, like, I'm not going to require anything crazy for stabilize, no round or anything. Just a uh, con save or somebody, you know, taking the time to make sure their person's okay. If you're sacrificing a turn, I think that's more than enough in that situation. Not the ideal way to play it, but that's how it's working at the table. So she gets dropped to zero, and it's a crucial moment. Because now the highest armor class in the party is unconscious, now the action economy in the party is cut by a third, and the remaining characters barely standing on their own feet. And there's a moment of honest communication. Both my wife and my son um, are incredibly driven individuals. That's my nice way of saying that cooperation is minimal at times. They tend to just do their own thing and that is that. I think that's the first time I've ever run a character completely out of magic in this game, by the way. So that was a fun little adventure and more than enough for us to be able to buy that broadsword. We'll go with the broadsword first, because better attack means more damage, means quicker combats. Should be able to sell our existing weapon at the item store. Oh yeah, the copper sword from the very beginning. Literally the first weapon you get in this game. No more room to carry things. Okay, that's a problem. Give Orpheo another medical herb. We haven't had to break into the items too much this round. That's always good. Oop. Let's go ahead and equip that. There we go. Now we're up to 66 attack. Now we can start stepping up to things.
sell off that copper sword. And we're halfway to our play mail. So, good times all around there. <clears throat> but they sat there and discussed it. And my wife wanted my son to just focus on taking out... At this point, they're down to a couple henchmen and a wolf. And the boss had yet to join the fray. Or maybe, maybe they had finished off the henchman, it was just the boss at this point. But either way, it was a crucial situation very late in the encounter. And my son instantly just looked at his own mother and respectfully just told her, okay, that's crazy. And instead just sort of threw caution to the wind had his mage skip a turn with a practically guaranteed magic missile, its roll to cast but with advantage, and sent his mage to stabilize the thief, uh, while the fighter, who's literally just wobbly in the knees, just kind of standing on his last, was going to do everything he could to hold off this attack. So I gave him an attack with advantage. Uh, for just the heroic effort. Stabilize the thief. There were a couple of minions left as I'm saying it out loud. Because the thief got to pop up on her next turn and took out one of the grunts. And they managed to finish off the encounter, literally thanks to some of the luckiest damage rolls that I've ever seen. For the life of me, I could not hit anything more than one or two damage down the stretch. And I wasn't sad about that at all. Because it gave this a great moment of every time I announced a hit. Just that little feeling of, oh god, this is it. And then the die rolled, you heard some clickety clacks on the table, looked down, and just saw one pep on the d6. And it was, oh, we make it out again. There was such an amazing sense of tension to the end of that combat. Hey, we will take 28 damage out of Agog here. Huh? So they made it through, they saved the farming village, and they finally achieved the goal that was laid out for my son some time ago. This is our first baboon battle in Dragon Quest 2. As you can see, baboons hit crazy hard. Also pay pretty well. But this raises an interesting conundrum for me, because over the past couple weeks I've really been focusing on prep uh, for one leg of the encounter up in the first portion of my world map. I've been fleshing out areas, sort of doodling little one-page dungeons in my little DM's notebook and everything. I bought a columnar tablet, the ones with the two-tone green paper and all sorts of little boxes, because I like writing small. And um, I find that's a really nice way for me personally to organize my things uh, between the columnar tablet and the four color pen. But I have all sorts of towns and dungeons and points of interest and random tables for a hex crawl. Picked up an antidote and I think we're going to go item heavy on this restock here. Sort of cut down on what we're carrying to hand. Maybe not, because, well, we do have one spare antidote. Let's go ahead and use that on Agog, and then we'll have Orpheo cast antidote on himself.
get hit points back up for both characters. Seems a little wasteful on the MP, but it's going to give us another combat here. We were doing so good on not getting poisoned, and then we took, you know, two to the chin there. The village, impoverished village, and, uh, but they cobbled together what gold they could, given the fact that they make their means primarily by farming and fishing, and they've been raided by these goblins like crazy. And my son, again, ever the noble one, turned down the reward originally. So the town met them halfway. They said, we have to pay you something, and in addition, uh, the unofficial keys to the city. So they're now welcomed there anytime. And it's sort of a town that kind of only exists in my head as a place for them to retreat to to be safe while doing this encounter. The dungeon I had put in the world map, but this town I really hadn't. So I made it a sort of nondescript little, just tiny sort of hamlet on the way to a town on the map, which is only one hex away. And now I get to start populating out the areas of the southern reaches today which is where they're at. They're in the northern part of the southern reaches. So geographically speaking, they're not too far uh, from some of the areas I've already populated on the first sheet of the map. As I'm sort of doing this sheet by sheet off of a legal tablet and drawing my own hex map and whatnot. But it's gonna be fun to sort of dig into this area that in my head is more wild, less civilized, and a bit more mysterious from a lore perspective. I have my broad sort of brush strokes for what I want story-wise out of this area to gel into the world story overall, but nothing super specific yet. Ooh, lizard fly can cast fire. Baboons are going to hit like a truck, and centipods poison. This is going to be a challenging encounter. Let's see if Agog can take out this centipod. Fireball should take out the lizard fly. Couldn't quite take out the centipod. That's a problem. And Agog is dead. That's a real problem. We should run. Agog tried to run, but there was no escape. We got one more shot at this. Whew. Orfeo just drags us out. That's Agog's first death. Now it's time to limp back to town. And of course, we get stopped right before it, and it's four Cobras. Successful run there. That was as close a call as you could get, honestly. <coughs> oh, that was a little tense. There goes 200 gold worth of delicate grinding. And that's going to delay us a little bit in our mission to get the plate mail. But that's fine. We should be a bit more careful out there. But that is how the session went. And I just mainly wanted to stop in and mention, A, how cool it was to see the party kind of have their growth moment in that session, going from at the beginning being so headstrong in their own individual plans that they kind of almost blew a chance to um, not so much surprise but gain an edge 
on the sentry posted at the land bridge by not working together to this sort of have to make sure everyone gets out alive in the crux of this battle. I think that's where we're going to wrap it up here. We'll have to get the plate mail another day. Um, a fantastic run in Dragon Quest II. Really minimal on that talk. It was just grinding. But we got some quality stuff in. Both characters gained a level. And we got a new weapon for Agog. So not a terrible session overall. Uh, any progress is progress. And that was tangibly beneficial. And now I'm going to uh, grab my notebook and start planning out places and spaces. I uh, do hope you've enjoyed this, and uh, you all take care and have a good day. This again has been a grumpy old guy doing a little gaming, and uh, we will see you around.